Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. I pray you speak through my vocal cords. Think through my mind. None of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Welcome, Wednesday night crew, uh, to another, really another edition of this series of moving from prayer into communion. And tonight, as I promised last Wednesday, we're going to talk about praying in the spirit. And this is going to really, uh, really going to challenge your thinking in some areas. So let me start off with this statement. To pray in the spirit is to pray with not just our head or our mind. To pray in the spirit is to pray not just with our head or our mind, but with the inspiration, with the help, and with the ability of the Holy Spirit. And let me say that again. To pray in the spirit is to pray not just with your head, you know, you know, bowing your heads and, and praying silent, or not just with your mind. I've already established that you can do that. But praying in the spirit is with the inspiration, is with the help, and it's with the ability of the Holy Ghost. Inspiration, the help, and the ability of the Holy Ghost. And so when we talk about praying in the spirit, we're talking about the Holy Spirit being involved, inspiring, helping, you know, and, and his ability to pray. And so this encompasses all true praying, whatever the form it takes, because the Bible says that we should always do our praying in the spirit. Now, what does that mean? Go to Ephesians chapter 6, 18. This is so important. All true praying, whatever the form it takes. Now, Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying always. Now, this is interesting. With all prayer and supplication, praying in the spirit and watching thereunto with all uh, perse perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so, again, if we pray in the spirit, it's going to involve the Holy Spirit helping the Holy Spirit inspiring, and the Holy Spirit releasing his ability for us to be able to do that. Now look at Jude, verse 20. We, we mentioned this the last time that we were together. Jude, verse 20, he says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves, and I said to you in closing, you're building yourself up spirit, soul, and body, building up yourselves uh, on your most holy faith. Here's what he calls your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Spirit or praying in the Holy Ghost. Build yourself up. Somebody says, well, I feel like I'm getting a cold. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Well, I don't feel good today. I feel sad. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Spend time praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, always praying in the Spirit, always building yourself. So I see why he recommends praying in the Spirit always, because praying in the Holy Ghost builds you up. And um, so what he's trying to show us is don't cease to pray in the Spirit. Don't, don't all of a sudden decide one day, well, I'm not going to pray in the Spirit anymore. Because it will build you up. I mean, at your lowest times in your life, praying in the Spirit is what's going to build you up. So there are deeper dimensions to praying in the Spirit. We talked about praying in tongues the other week. But it goes, it goes even deeper, deeper dimensions in praying in the Spirit. Um, look at Romans chapter 8 and 26. Let's examine this as we, we take on this today because this is, this is going to be interesting. Romans 8, 26. He says, likewise, the Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit, also helpeth our infirmities. Now, infirmities are weaknesses of the flesh. Or it helps you to do what you can't do in your natural abilities. So it says the Spirit is going to help you with the weaknesses of the flesh. And then he says, colon, so he's getting ready to tell you the specific weakness of the flesh that the Holy Spirit's going to help. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth us in our affirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That's the weakness of the flesh. Not knowing what you should pray for as you ought to pray for. Not knowing what we should pray. So, so there are things that we don't know how to pray for it like we should pray for it. Uh, and, and, and it has to add a little bit more, things that we should pray for that we might not even know that we should pray for. 
What if something's going on with your kid or something's going on with a situation? You, you don't know that. I mean, unless somebody brings it to your attention, only then would you be able to know to pray for it. But what if it's not brought to your attention? What if it's not brought to your understanding? What, how do you pray for something you don't know? Well, that would be a weakness of the flesh. You will be limited in praying if you don't know that something needs to be prayed about. That's what he's talking here. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray. I don't know what I should pray about if I don't know about it. You, you know, you tell me, well, my mother's sick. Could you pray for her? Oh, yeah, I could pray for her because she's sick. Uh, but if I didn't know she was sick, I wouldn't know to pray for her. That's the weakness of the flesh he's talking about. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit. It says itself, but the Holy Spirit's not an it. He's a person. The Spirit himself maketh intercession. You intercede by praying for another. The Spirit now begins to pray and make intercession for us. All right, so check it out. So I don't know what to pray for as I ought to pray, but the Spirit knows what to pray for. The Spirit knows what to pray for. And so the Spirit begins to pray for us with groanings which cannot be uttered groanings. You ever heard of that before? He's going to pray through groanings. I don't know what to pray for, but the Spirit will begin to activate and begin to uh, move upon me when I'm praying, and then all of a sudden I pause, and I start groaning in the Spirit about something that I may not know of. Now, notice he says the Spirit maketh intercession for us, and how does he do it? With groanings. Now, before I used to automatically assume, well, that just means tongues. Well, let's dig a little bit into what I refer to as the prayer of groanings, all right? Now, this kind of prayer can take the form of sobbing. This kind of prayer can take the form of weeping. The heart is so full that the expression of it takes the form of groaning and weeping because your heart's so full of something that you might not even know of, it begins to be expressed with weeping and groanings. So Jesus prayed like this in Hebrews chapter 5 and 7. Turn there. Hebrews chapter 5 and 7. You remember, well, I, I think I'll show it to you here, but I think a lot of times we think that prayer has to be like articulated out loud in order for it to be prayer. I think I showed you before where in, I believe it was Psalms 5 and 1, that, you know, God gave attention to the meditation and called it prayer. But look at this. Jesus did this. He says, who in the days of his flesh, uh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. All right, now notice something here. Hebrews chapter 5 and 7 um, especially the part that he, he offered up prayers and supplications, how? With strong crying and tears. That's groanings. That's the prayer of groanings. That his heart was so full that he offered up prayers and do you read? I'm, I'm reading, you reading the same thing I'm reading. He offered up prayers and supplications, how? With strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And, and was heard in that he feared. Now, this is, this is amazing to me. I, I have been in times where my heart was so full of something, I could not articulate what to pray for because I didn't know what was going on. I just, and as I spent time in, with God, I'd begin to cry and, I'd, and, 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 and begin to groan. I'm offering up prayers. That is such a deeper dimension that every time I did there, did that and prayed that way, and it hadn't been like a whole lot of times, but when I did pray that way, the results were almost, I mean, immediate and strong. Now, follow with me now. Some other times you are just there on your knees and no words are coming out of your lips, but there's a deep groaning going on inside leading to, to, kind of like intermittent sighs. 
and noise that you make. Now, now somebody says, that, that, that's, what are you talking about? That's, that's not scripture. If you've ever been through something like this before, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, then listen to me carefully. Now, I've got to be able to show you scriptural reference to back up what I'm saying, or it just sounds like a bunch of weird stuff. All right, so let's go to John chapter 11, verse 33 through 35. John chapter 11, 33 through 35. Um, let's look at verse 33. In fact, I think I'm going to read all the way down to verse 46. Um, pretty important. He said, um, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned. Did you see that? If you haven't paid attention to it, it's like you probably just read over it. He groaned in the spirit. How do you groan in the spirit? He groaned in the spirit. He was troubled in his heart. You follow what I'm saying? And he groaned in the spirit. Go to the next, next. keep going. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. That's groaning. Jesus is groaning the whole time. Now, I never really, I always use this scripture to poke fun at people who didn't read the Bible and, and say, well, the only scripture they knew was Jesus wept. But when Jesus wept here, that was groaning. It was, a, it was, it was the key to this man's resurrection. While he was on the way to see where, where he was, the Bible says he was groaning in the spirit because he was troubled in his heart and he began to weep. That's the description I just talked to you about. That's called groan. That's a prayer of groaning in the spirit. And then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. So they thought he was weeping because, you know, like you do at funerals, you hear somebody died and you start crying. Oh, Lord Jesus. And then they say, oh, look at him. He must have really loved him. That is not what was going on. He was in a dimension of prayer that was about to do a very miraculous thing. And he said, and some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? He taking it, he take care of it right now, but they don't know what's going on. He said, God, we've seen him open eyes. He can't, he can't do nothing about this. He is. Jesus, therefore, again, watch this groaning in himself. I, there was a time I read so over this. I remember it was a few years ago God revealed this to me, but I kept reading over this. I am telling you, this is, the, this is one of the most, the deepest dimension of praying that I had ever come across. I'd never read it in books. I've never seen it. And it was like, man, look at this. And, and then Jesus again groaning in himself, coming to the grave. What was he doing? He was praying the prayer of groaning. He says, and, he, and the Bible says, it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, and saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead for four days. Now, I, I just got to pause right here. What kind of supernatural power was Jesus, Jesus accessing? to be able to raise a man up who had been dead for four days to the point where he starts to, all kinds of stuff starts after four days. And Jesus said unto her, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God or the manifestations of God? 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where he, where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, watch this. I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Well, when was he doing something to be heard? When he was groaning and weeping and shedding tears. He was praying the prayer of groanings and then said, thank you that you've heard me. Thank you that you've heard me. Now watch this. And I knew that thou heareth me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said, thank you that you heard me, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 43. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. See, when you pray about something, 
and you know that thing's been taken care of, then you lose, you lose your authority on that thing. I want to show you how authority and prayer works together, the authority that's involved in praying. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. I often think, how did that boy get up? He was kind of wrapped like a mummy. How did you get up? There's a power of God was so strong it lifted him up, I believe. And he says, then many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did and they believed on him. They believed on him. Verse 46, but some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Listen, I believe we're there. I believe God's revealing this revelation because we're there. A lot of people are not going to believe just because we say it. A lot of people are not going to believe just because they hear me preach. But boy, when they see the glory of God doing things that should not, that you can't figure out how they did it on the physical, in this physical world, then they're going to go away believing. I prophesied this to you, uh, Wednesday night crew. Get ready for the supernatural to invade your life. But I'm showing you, look at what Jesus was doing. The house of prayer became the house of power. But then here's Jesus praying in a deeper dimension of prayer that very few Christians even know about. And, and it would not be fair for Jesus to be able to pray this way and, 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 we not, would, would, and we can't pray this way. In fact, I'll show you a minute that Paul prayed in groanings. And everybody that prayed in groanings got a significant amount of manifestations that came in, in their life. In fact, look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 46. Luke 19, 28 through 46. Um, and when he had, and when he had um, thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh, to Bethpage, Beth, 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 and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go you into the village over against you, in the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon, you, whereon yet never a man sat, loose him and bring him hither. So Jesus is, is calling for this coat because he's going to ride in on the Palm Sunday on, on a coat. And if any man asks you, why do you lose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord has need of him. Go ahead. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. 33. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, why loose ye the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the, uh, the, 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 the descents of the mount, the descent, excuse me, of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And, um, and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city. Now watch this. And he wept over it. Now, I normally thought, well, there you go again, crying. I thought it was a weeping Christ. He's praying. He's, he's praying over the city. Not crying over the city. He's praying. Groanings. A great uh, fullness in his heart. He wept over it. Keep going. Saying, if thou hast known, even thou at least in these thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee 
and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee a one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that brought, verse 46, saying unto them, it is written, my house is, is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. This is so interesting because Jesus goes in and he purifies the house. He cast all this, this mess out. And so the house became a house of purity. He kicked all of the junk out. And then after the house became a house of purity, it became a house of prayer. And then when the house became a house of prayer, it was able to become a house of power. A house of power. Now, let me, let me say this to you. All of this started at this groanings. He began to pray and begin to weep and begin to groan. Then he began to prophesy. He's being equipped for what he was getting ready to go in to do, to do. He knew what was going to happen. He talked to them about missing their day of visitation. I'm telling you, what would happen if we could get a revelation of this type of praying? The level it would lift us up. Jesus went in that city in power and discernment and prophecy and boldness. But it started right there when he saw the city and he began to weep, and he began to groan, and began to pray that prayer of groaning. So now the Apostle Paul also had a similar experience. Look at this in the book of Galatians chapter 4 and 19. Galatians chapter 4 and 19. This is, this is awesome. Look at verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail, underline that word travail, I travail in birth again until Christ be found or formed in you. My little children, I travail. So the Apostle Paul had this experience, travailing in prayer. I've heard the term. Now I understand what it means. Um, it's like travail in birth. All right, so if you travail in prayer, what's going on when you're travailing in birth? I'm telling you, you can hardly find the words. If you've ever had the opportunity to see a child born, that travailing in birth, it's a lot of groaning and crying that's involved. And Paul was describing a lot of groaning and crying that was involved when he began to pray. And he described that type of prayer as travailing. He said that uh, of whom, he says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed into you. He was describing this same kind of prayer that produced these miracles in the life of Jesus. Hallelujah. Again, when Paul was describing his great burden for his people Israel who had not known Christ as their Savior and Lord, here's what he said in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, when he was describing his great burden for his people in Israel. Here's what Paul said. Verse 1, he says, uh, Romans 9, verse 1, he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. So what's the indication here? When there's a great heaviness in your heart, Jesus was troubled in his heart, okay? He says, for I, I could wish that myself were accused from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So Paul was describing this burden that was in his heart. Great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, full of compassion. It's not worry. It's this, I'm so full of compassion, I am carrying this heavy in my heart. And I tell you, the results of this is going to be praying the prayer of groaning. It's going to be praying this prayer that Jesus prayed that caused a man who was dead for four days to be raised from the dead. So we need the help of the Holy Spirit to rediscover what it means to pray with groanings that cannot be uttered. We need, we need the Holy Spirit to help us to rediscover this kind of prayer where we're praying with groanings that literally that cannot be uttered. I, I thought, I don't know, I did all kinds of things with that scripture to try to make sense. 
And, you know, I tried to say, well, you know, uttered inarticulate speech. So that means tongues. No, he's literally talking about, you know, uh, the, the prayer of groanings. A prayer where you're so full of compassion, you can't quite get to the words to speak. And it comes out with groanings and tears. Uh, I, I've gone through that before. I, I remember when Tap and I went to... Um, where is this island? It's in South Carolina. I forgot the name of it, but we went there, and I had a word of the Lord, and thank God she was with me. Kiowa, Kiowa Islands. And I, I said, uh, God told me to go away, and he would speak to me and show me the path I need to take. I felt like I'm, I'm preaching in church. The church was growing. I was doing four services on Sunday, and I'm thinking, I, I need to know what's happening here. And what to do and what I'm supposed to be doing and so immediately we got there I don't think I even unpacked and I got in that room I got on the floor uh, and I just went at it I just started praying in the Holy Spirit you know two three hours and around the end of that third hour uh, my heart just got so full and I remember I, I could not I was trying to continue to pray in tongues and my heart was just filled with uh, heaviness, with compassion. And I, I could, uh, there was just little syllables come out. And then I would break out crying. And then there was more syllables coming out. And then I'd break out crying. And when the syllables started coming out and I'm breaking out crying, then I had a vision. And I saw exactly what I was supposed to be doing. And I knew that's what I was supposed to be doing. After that vision was over with, I, I, I got what I came there for, and I told her, I said, I'm done. I said, I thought it was going to take three or four days, but once I got into the prayer of groanings, I got everything I needed at that time. Um, I wish I'd have known that then. I didn't, and I think we took off. I mean, I think we spent the night and drove back home the next day. I was done. It's just something that it, when it happened, I didn't know what it was. I, I saw it throughout college where... Man, I was so poor, I couldn't afford to buy dirt. And I just would, uh, you know, spend time on the weekends praying in the Holy Spirit and sucking on peanut butter and just praying. And one time I just got so full. And, and then, then things just started breaking, breaking loose. Things just started happening. Uh, I believe it's a dimension that God wants us to return to. And my prayer today is that we will believe the Holy Spirit for us to rediscover this dimension of prayers and praying in groanings, um, which may sound strange to the majority of church people. But ladies and gentlemen, I just took you through the scriptures. And I'm not even finished with this yet, but I took you through the scriptures to show you the power of, of this type of praying. And so I just believe that as you begin, and, and here's how I think this starts. As you begin to go from prayer to communion and communing with God, I think you're going to go from prayer to communing with God. You're going to go from prayer, praying in the Holy Spirit and communing with God. You're going to go from the study of word, prayer, to communing with God. And all of that communing with God is going to bring you to that, that uh, deeper level of praying and groanings. And I, I think you're going to see the dead raised. I think you're going to see the sick get healed. I think you're going to see supernatural things happen. I just don't believe we spend enough time fellowshipping with God to allow him to place these things on our heart. And, you know, one of the things about intercession is you have to be available. Are you available for God to use to intercede for our nation, our families, our children, are you available for that? If you are, then this can be a reality in your life. And again, I'm telling you, yeah, I showed you the scriptures. I showed you Jesus doing it. But I'm telling you something I've experienced myself. It's the most powerful thing ever. And, and, and you're talking about, you know, worrying and, and concerns. It just kind of goes away because you just know that God's got it. There's a, there's a, I, I, I don't have, I really can't articulate, uh, the, there's such a holiness about this prayer of groanings that you know, you know God heard you and you know you made connection and you know you made contact with God. 
And so this is a pretty amazing, amazing truth. Um, and so I'm going to pick up uh, on our next uh, lesson. We're going to look at another dimension of praying in the Spirit and spend the rest of our time praying and talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're also going to move into dealing with the five reasons to pray in tongues. And, and so we'll get back to praying in tongues, talk about the five reasons to pray in tongues, and I think this is going to be an amazing, amazing time. Father, we thank you for our time today. We thank you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have a, a witness, we have an example of this dimension of praying. Teach us more about it. Lead us more into it. That as we begin to operate in this dimension of praying, we're going to see some amazing things. Oh, thank you so much for what we're learning. Thank you so much for what we're understanding. Thank you, Lord, for this Wednesday night crew that would take the time out to go through this journey as we study prayer. And Father, I thank you for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. Hey, look, if you've not been born again, but you'd like to get born again, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, well over 2,000 people have prayed this prayer with me and they have given their heart to Jesus. And it still amazes me that through this virtual experience that people are getting saved. If you're not saved and you'd like to be saved, repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner, but right now I repent of my sins. I make you my Lord and my Savior. I invite you into my heart to be my Savior. Thank you for saving me. I receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you pray that simple prayer with me, I want to say congratulations. But if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to get a gift into your hands. If you'll just go ahead and text the keyword, I'm saved, to 51555 and include your name and email address, I want to send you a free ebook as you begin your walk with Christ today. And I believe that the best is yet to come in your life. And the most valuable thing you can do as a new Christian is to spend time getting to know who Jesus is. Amen. Well, it's opportunity to worship God with our, our finances and our gifts that we can bring. What an what amazing thing that we have in this pandemic, the technology to do that. You're talking about God, you know, having stuff ready. Oh, my goodness. It's amazing. And, and I'm grateful that I can still give my seed and I can tithe and I can give gifts to the kingdom of God to make sure it continues to go on to do what it needs to do. And I tell you, it's been a, an honor and a, and a really a big pleasure to be able to use my phone, uh, to go online, uh, to, to bring it to the church. It's just been an amazing type of thing. So if you would like to give through the text uh, technology, you can text World Changers space and then the amount to 74483. Or you can dial the number on your screen, 866-477-7683. Or you can give uh, uh, on that, to that address if you want to mail it or online at creflodollarministries.org or worldchangerschurch.org. And um, celebrate that you have an opportunity to worship God with your gifts. And it's a powerful thing to know that your worship is not... Uh, complete without the giving of gifts. That's something we know. It's not something we argue with. It's something that we know. And what a blessing it's turned out to be in our lives. Well, I want to thank you guys so much. Remember, we're not finished with this series. We spent the last couple of weeks, you know, dealing with the Holy Spirit and, and praying in the Spirit. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, groanings in the Spirit, and we're really going to get into this and I pray that your prayer life is going from one level to the next level to the next level. What is the goal? The goal is to commune with him. God bless you. Have an amazing evening and we'll see you soon.